started, so the vote was to move, jump right into non-parametric Bayes. For your interest, though, there is the whole foundational thing up there, uh, which goes into it a bit deeper than we did in 705. You might want to just read through it on your own. It's kind of fun, especially the beginning. The first section, which is called Hunting for a Treasure in Flatland, is something called Stone's Paradox. Everybody in the world, well, every statistician and machine learner should know what Stone's Paradox is. And you should follow through it carefully because you're going to be surprised how counterintuitive it is. And it's a good, if you want to have fun, get together one night, three people, get some beer. One person takes the part of the Bayesian, one person takes the part of the Fickendus, the other person is the moderator hiding the treasure. And play it and put some money in. Each of you put $20 in and we'll see who's richer at the end of the night, the Fickendus or the Bayesian. <coughs> It, it, yeah, uh, not beer. I don't endorse uh, imbibing alcohol. I meant to say uh, Pepsi. Okay. <laughs> I think they're all of legal age, though. So we're going to talk about non-parametric Bayes, uh, which is, it was pretty interesting. So the constructions themselves and so on are are. Uh, quite clever. And the idea is to do the same kind of thing we've been talking about, density estimation and, and regression, but do it from a Bayesian point of view. Of course, the interpretation will be quite different, right? Because it's not going to have the frequency guarantees, but we're still going to try to compute a prior and a posterior. And it raises some interesting questions because we're dealing with now infinite dimensional spaces. Just remember, if we were dealing with, let's just review the parametric case, we would have a sample from a density given theta. Because we're doing this in a Bayesian framework, we would regard theta as a random variable as well. So it would have a prior pi. And then the, the mechanics at that point are easy, right? Now you just do Bayes' theorem. Let me try to use the same symbols, which we know we learned is just the likelihood times the prior. Okay, and so that's how we did Bayesian inference in 705, and probably 701 you did some of this too. Once you have the likelihood, or I should say, once you have a model specified, <clears throat> once you have a prior distribution for theta, it's all mechanical after that. You just multiply the likelihood times the prior, you get the posterior. The posterior, you get, let's say the mean could be your point estimator. You could find a 95% posterior region. Uh, that would be your Bayesian uh, sort of a Bayesian version of a confidence interval, although it's often called a credible region. And that, so that would be a set, let's say A, which has probability 1 minus alpha. <clears throat> the interpretation then is that theta regarded as a random quantity, random in the sense of not frequencies, but in degrees of belief, that the probability that theta is in there given the data is 1 minus alpha. And as I stressed in 705, that doesn't mean that A traps the true value 95% of the time. That would be a confidence interval. Okay. And of course, the, the, there can be difficult computing issues because computing the posterior can be difficult. And I don't know if we'll talk about simulation methods or not. I'm sure you did some of them in 701. But there's things like Monte Carlo Markov chain methods for simulating from the posterior. So even if you can't write down the posterior exactly, often we can simulate from it fairly easily. And still find all the things we want, like the 95% the intervals and so on. So at least conceptually, the nice thing about Bayes is it's all very simple, right? It's just likelihood times prior. That it has a nice unifying feel, feeling to it. But what we want to do is extend this to, to uh, the non-parametric setting. So I'm assuming, again, because of the prerequisites, that you're all familiar with how to do this in the parametric setting. Any questions about that before we jump into the harder non-parametric case? Everybody okay with that? Yeah. I have a different question. Uh, historically, did Bayesian non-parametrics try to copy non-parametrics that are not Bayesian, or did they develop kind of independently? No, <clears throat> that's a good question. So um, I wouldn't even just say historically. I'd say <clears throat> quite a bit now. Uh, there's an attempt often to copy the frequentist answer. And that's something we'll talk about, <clears throat> which is, uh, how does it relate to the frequentist answer? In fact, the first thing we're going to talk about is estimating the CDF. There'll be a very close connection. I 
I, I have a name for that. Whenever people do Bayesian things and try to get them to behave like the frequentist answer, I call that frequentist pursuit. It's like you're trying to chase the frequentist. And so <coughs> that, I'll, I'll use that terminology later. So if we're going to do non-parametric Bayes, though, let's think about estimating a CDF or a density function or regression function. In fact, there's a lot of different problems we could consider, but I am, I am going to restrict attention to two or three of these problems, which is the simplest problem is how do you estimate a cumulative distribution function using non-parametric Bayes? How do you estimate a density function? And then how do you estimate a regression function? And of course, there's many ways to do this, but I'm, in each case, I'm going to pick what I consider to be the most common way of doing it. But let's start with the CDF question. So I'm giving you data, let's say real value data. Here's some data points, x1 to xn, from an unknown distribution f. And the goal is to estimate f. And all we know is it's some CDF on the, on the real line. Actually, let's first review how we would do this from the frequentist point of view. How do we estimate the CDF non-parametrically? Remember that? I know you remember, come on. One non yeah. The empirical CDF, right. So you put mass 1 over n on each data point. Or in other words, we take this empirical CDF is just the number of observations less than or equal to x over n. That's the empirical CDF. And we, we saw that in 705. We saw that that's a consistent estimator. And let's, let's, let me amplify that remark a bit. What I mean by consistent in this case is that the soup over all x's, but also the soup over every possible distribution function, goes to zero on probability. In fact, we had an inequality for how far apart they are. And we'll come back to that when we get to concentration and measure later in the course. But we did this in 705. We can say how far the CDF is. We know that the probability that the empirical CDF the probability that the maximum difference between the empirical CDF and the true CDF is more than epsilon, and that's less than or equal to this. This is called the DKW inequality. Dvorsky, Kiefer, Wolfowitz. And if we set that equal to alpha and solve, we're going to get epsilon is what? 1 over 2n log 1 over alpha, something like that. And why do we care about that? Well, that says that if I set alpha to be this number, then I know that f hat never differs from alpha by more than this with probability at most alpha. So therefore, I have a confidence band. If I take the function f hat of x plus or minus that epsilon, so it's going to look like this. Here's my empirical CDF, which is a step function. If I add and subtract epsilon, I get a band that looks like this. That band, let's call this, uh, it's really two functions, a lower and an upper function. The probability that the true function is trapped between those two things for all x is at least 1 minus alpha. So this we did in 705. Let's make sure that the meaning of that's really clear, because this is where we start to get to the distinction again between the Bayesian and the frequentist thing. So let's imagine the following thought experiment. All right, I wake up every morning, and I make up a CDF, any CDF in the universe. It could be, as, it could be a normal, but it could be some bizarre thing. I generate n observations, and I give you the n observations. And that's all I do is I give you the data. You now just compute f hat plus or minus this epsilon, and you're going to get some sort of band. Tomorrow, I make up a completely new CDF, unrelated to the first one. 
I generate n observations. I give them to you, and you do the same thing. We do this every day. And after a long period of time, I can say, how often did your band contain the true function? And we know the answer is at least 95% of the time. OK, so it's the usual confidence set. So that's the frequentist solution to estimating the CDF. And now we'll do the Bayesian one. Let me just see if there's any questions about that. Any questions? OK, <clears throat> so we have a complete frequentist solution. Now we want to do the Bayesian solution. This is the, the most common way of doing this is to use something called a Dirichlet process, which was invented by a statistician, Tom Ferguson, at UCLA in 1973, I think. And there's some vexing questions we have to deal with. What's the parameter space? Well, it's kind of hard to picture it, but as usual, when I have something I can't quite picture, I just draw a blob. So I'm going to draw a blob. <coughs> this is script F, let's call it. What is this? That's the set of all CDFs on the real line. It's really an infinite dimensional set. You can't parameterize it by a finite number of parameters. So the blob is kind of a simplification, but that's all I can draw. So each point in here represents a CDF. So here's what we need to do. We need to, to do a few things. We need to first describe how are we going to put a prior on that set. Once we have the prior and once we have the data, we have to ask, how do we get the posterior? Okay. And here's the part that's going to be a bit confusing. We do not get the posterior using Bayes' rule. We often think that Bayesian inference revolves around Bayes' rule. It doesn't. So it's, it's, this is an example where Bayes' rule doesn't apply. The posterior is perfectly well defined. Bayes' rule is a way of getting the posterior under certain conditions. For, ha, anybody here taken measure theory yet? Oh, OK. Well, then the following sentence won't make sense. <coughs> Bayes' rule only works when there's a sigma finite dominating measure. One day you'll know what that means. There's no sigma finite dominating measure in this set. So you can't use Bayes' theorem, but that doesn't mean the posterior doesn't exist. Let me give you the intuition for that. How could the posterior exist if I can't use Bayes' rule? Well, imagine if I have a random variable, let's say O theta. And imagine I have a distribution for another random variable, x, for any given theta. So this is the typical statistical scenario. Well, since I know the distribution of x given theta, and I know the distribution of theta, that implies I have a joint distribution for x and theta, right? I'm, if you think about simulating, that actually, that's a good way to think about all of this non-parametric Bayesian stuff, because you can't write formulas for a lot of the things, but we can often simulate from them. So knowing a distribution, we usually think of as knowing a formula for the density. But if there is no density, you can't think of a distribution that way. So another way to think about knowing a distribution is if I know how to draw a sample from that distribution, then I know the distribution. That's just a more algorithmic way of saying what does it mean to know what a distribution is. So if I know how to simulate a theta, and I know how to simulate x given theta, I know how to simulate a pair. So that defines a joint density. Now once I have a joint density, I can, I can, say, I can turn it around and say, can I rewrite that the other way? I can always say, um, imagine simulating an x and simulating a theta given an x. Because we can always decompose this right either direction. And so that means implicitly there is a marginal distribution for x you've defined, and there's also a conditional distribution for theta given x. So the, the distribution is well defined, but you can't get it by Bayes' theorem. You can't multiply it. There's no likelihood function in this case. Because there's no densities. These CDFs don't even have densities, most of them. They have, like, can have atoms in them and things like that. Okay. So it's kind of weird, but just bear with me. We're going to define a prior, and we're going to define a posterior, even though we're never going to write down Bayes', Bayes theorem. And this is kind of the, the, the way it goes in, in non-parametric Bayes in, in many cases. Okay, you just have to think about it a little bit more abstractly. So let me start with the prior. How do I put a prior in the space of all CDFs? There's many possible ways of doing it, but the most common one is the Dirichlet process prior. So I want to describe this prior. <coughs> it's called, I'll write it like this, Dirichlet process. It's got some hyperparameters. So remember when we did parametric Bayes, we might have said on theta, I need a prior. Maybe I'll use a normal prior. But the normal itself had parameters, a mean and a variance. Those are called hyper, 
hyperparameters, the parameters you needed to specify the prior. So the same thing is true here. To define this prior pi, this Dirichlet process, I have to specify, and this is a number, and this is a CDF. And the way to think about it is, this F0 is your prior guess of the CDF. And the alpha is a measure of how strongly you believe in that guess. It's a real number. Okay? And you'll see, when we see the posterior, it'll be a bit clearer. But you're wondering, what is this Dirichlet process prior? So again, instead of describing the prior, I can't write a formula for it. I'm going to describe it in two ways. I'm going to describe a way to simulate from it, and then I'm going to describe it in terms of its certain characterization of it. So you'll never know this prior in the same sense that you know and love any other distribution like a normal or a gamma, but you just get familiar with its properties and that's the sense in which you know it. So how would I simulate from this prior? So let's go back, let me just go back to the parametric world again, just to make sure we have a clear analogy here. So suppose I had a prior like theta was normal 0, 1, let's say. Well, you know you could write down the density, but I can also just give you an algorithm that says here's how you simulate theta from this from this distribution. And we're going to do the same thing now. How would I, we're going to ask not what's the formula, but how do I simulate a single draw from this prior? Here's the algorithm. So we're going to draw independent random variables, and we're going to imagine we can draw infinitely many. In practice, you could stop at a thousand, let's say, but Conceptually, we draw an infinite sequence IID from your prior guess. Okay, so we're going to place those <coughs> on the real line. So maybe this is S1, here's S2, here's S3, and so on. There's going to be a countable, countably infinite number of these points. Next, step two is to draw another infinite sequence. And these are all from a beta distribution with parameters one and alpha. What does a beta look like? Remember that a beta, what's a beta one alpha? That has a density, um, let me make sure I get it right. Which one's, that's going to be one minus u. Does this look right? Or is it u to the alpha minus one? I always forget. It's either u to the alpha minus 1 or 1 minus u. It's a distribution on 0, 1. I think that's, yeah, I think that's right. <coughs> so, so it looks something like this. Right? It's just some density on 0, 1. And I draw, again, an infinite number of these. Now comes the really cool part, the stick breaking part is called. So what you do is, I'm going to create a new set of variables. This is a deterministic transformation of these variables called w. So w1 is just equal to v1. So the way to picture what's going on is I'm taking a stick of length 1. I look at my first v. That's a number between 0 and 1, right? It's a random draw from this. Let's say it's here. So I imagine breaking off this stick. That's w1. Now for the second one, what I do is I look at v2, and I take that proportion of what's left over. So I take a proportion of this stick, <coughs> and that becomes w2. So in other words, w2 is v2 times what's left over, which is 1 minus v1. And then we break off that proportion of the stick. And then you continue that way. W3 is you just take V3 and take that proportion of that stick and you keep going. You keep breaking it down. And so you, that's the formula that's written down there. So what we're getting here by construction then is a sequence of Ws that sum up to 1 because they're going to add up to the whole stick. So it's a sequence of non-negative numbers that sum to 1. Is that clear? It's an infinite it is an infinite sequence. And there's actually something to prove to show that they actually formally sum to 1, but it, 
uh, and more, more rigorously, we should say, almost surely they sum to 1, because these are random after all. What do I do with these? What I do is I take those and I, I look at the first S1 that I drew and I put W1. That's how much mass I'm going to put on S1. Then I take my second W2, put it on top of S2, and so on. So I'm just placing this mass on these things. And what I've done is I've created a discrete distribution. I now have a bunch of points on the real line, and I've put mass down, and the mass sums up to 1. So it's a probability mass function. And so it defines a CDF. If I compute the CDF of that thing, it's going to be pretty bumpy. <clears throat> you can see it's not a continuous distribution. It's discrete. But nonetheless, if I define f to be, let's put it this way, f of t is the sum over j wj times the indicator of whether sj is less than or equal to t. Or if you want to think of it, it's a sum of, it's a weighted sum of Dirac delta functions, each one at one of the points. So it's going to be a kind of weird CDF. It's going to be very bumpy. There's jumps at each of the points. But it is a valid CDF. It's a real CDF. It goes to 0 to the left, goes to 1 to the right. It's non-decreasing, and so on. And um, that, what we've just done is construct a random distribution function. That random distribution function constitutes a draw. We've now just drawn a distribution from pi. Okay, so this, in some sense, you now know what a Dirichlet process is, in the sense that if somebody put a gun to your head and said, give me a random draw from a Dirichlet process, you could go and do it really quickly. You can't write down a formula, but you can certainly draw from it. So in that sense, you know what a Dirichlet process is. If somebody asked you, what do they typically look like, these you know, draws? You could just draw many times, many CDFs, and plot them and look at them and get a feeling for you know, what the prior is telling you. So it's kind of an indirect way to understand what the CDF is. Well, I, that's what I did, just told you in some sense. That <clears throat> yeah, that's it. <laughs> well, there is another characterization. Actually, any questions before I give you the other characterization? Yeah. Um, where does f not come from? Is it, it's our guess, right? But it's not a f not? Yeah, is that a parametric? No, well, f not. So we're being Bayesians. Right. And you're supposed to have prior beliefs. And this represents your prior belief of what you think f. Well, you're, I guess you're, you're, you're asking the ultimate question, which is how do you come up with a prior, really, in Bayesian inference? I wish I had an answer for that. But is, but is a prior a parametric, uh, uh, parametric distribution? Or? F0 can be an arbitrary distribution. Yeah. Anything. Okay. Yeah. Is it alpha parameter? Alpha is also a parameter, yes. So the, the, par the prior hyperparameters are a number and an, a CDF. This is supposed to represent your prior information. The WJ is sum to one almost surely, right? Yeah. Is there enough to characterize the CDF? Is there enough for uh, F to be a valid CDF? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let me give you another characterization of this Dirichlet process, which is actually the one that Ferguson originally used. So if you look at Ferguson's original paper, he didn't talk about this. This was due to, I think, Seth Raman was the one who came up with the stick-breaking interpretation. There's many different characterizations that are equivalent. The original one, and this actually explains how it got its name, is completely different. But first I need to remind you what a Dirichlet density is before we get to a Dirichlet process. So what's a Dirichlet density? So if I have a, um, a vector of numbers, a vector of parameters, let's say k parameters, and these are on the simplex. So these are all bigger than or equal to 0, and they sum to 1. So think of these, for example, as if you were estimating a multinomial distribution. The parameters of a multinomial are going to be p1, p2, up to pk, for one for each category, and they have to sum up to 1. 
How do you put a prior on that P? A common uh, distribution to use is the Dirichlet density. The Dirichlet density is just a generalization of the binomial. And so it's written, I'll write it this way. It's just the following product, j equals 1 to k, pj. Um, and then I, you can rewrite this. This is at the bottom of page four. These B i to j's have allowed to be arbitrary numbers. If we want to rewrite it in terms of something that sums to one, I can just rewrite this again into a more convenient form, which is p j to the alpha g j minus one, where alpha is the sum here. So I'm, I'm forcing, in other words, right, these are just, at this point, these are just arbitrary positive numbers. But I can just normalize it so that it's something times gj, where the gj is sum to 1, and there's an alpha there. Okay? So there's really, this beta I've kind of split now into two parameters, alpha and g. This you can think of, again, as a prior guess of the vector p, and this is a number. Did you see the Dirichlet in 701? Because this is commonly used in document modeling and things like that. So it's just a commonly used prior for multinomials. So what has that got to do with this thing? Well, it must have something to do with it because this is called a Dirichlet process. So here's the connection. The way Ferguson originally described the Dirichlet process is he says, I'm going to define, I'm going to say that a random distribution function, pi, or uh, f, so we're, we're drawing f from some pi. I'm going to claim, I'm going to say it has a Dirichlet process distribution. If, when it's restricted to any finite partition, I get a Dirichlet distribution. So in other words, he says, imagine you had some way, he hasn't even defined the process yet, but he says, suppose there was some way of drawing random f's, and that whenever you drew a random f, I can take any partition I want, as long as it's finite, Let's say like this, and so on, up to a k. And I can now take, somebody has somehow drawn a random f. I can now evaluate the probability of each element of the partition under this randomly drawn f. So let's, let me just call that f of a1. It's bad notation, but I just mean the, the, the amount of probability in this set under this distribution. That's a finite vector. Okay, somebody draws a random f, and now they compute the, the, the probability content of each element of this arbitrary partition. And now I can ask, well, since f was random, this vector is random, what distribution does it have? And Ferguson says, if it always has a Dirichlet distribution in that sense, with parameter alpha, and with the g, these g things being just the f0 of a1 and f0 of a k, then we say that f has a Dirichlet process distribution with parameters alpha and f0. So He's, this is very indirect again. He's saying, suppose there exists a random distribution, a way of drawing a random distribution f with the following property. I pick any partition. I compute the probability of the partition. I repeat. And I say, oh, look, it has a Dirichlet distribution with these parameters. If that's the case, then I'm going to say that this distribution for generating these random CDFs is a Dirichlet process. It's not immediately obvious there even exists such a process. A lot of what Ferguson's paper was about is proving that there exists such a process because it's defined very indirectly. He's saying, if there exists such a process, I'm going to call it a Dirichlet process. And he proves there does exist one. The, the algorithm I gave you a few minutes ago is more constructive. It tells you how to actually draw. Uh, so, each vi can be finite, right? It's just that they have to be finite. Unbounded, you mean? Yes. Yes, it's the number of them that's finite. That's right. 
although this does sort of give you another algorithm for drawing approximately from a Dirichlet process, you could, in practice, just divide the real line up into a fine mesh, and now just draw an ordinary Dirichlet thing, and then take it to be like uniform over that thing. That would approximate a random draw from a Dirichlet process. So you can just think of it as kind of a Dirichlet distribution, but on a very fine grid or something like that. So it is kind of natural if you could to go from multinomial, which is a bunch of probabilities, to just the real line, which is a whole bunch more probabilities. Okay. All right. So now we have two different ways to think about this Dirichlet process. They're very indirect, but hopefully you get the sense that there is some sort of prior sitting over the space of the CDFs, and it has some properties. And we're not going to go into the great detail about the properties. Again, Ferguson's paper, that's what it was all about, was what properties does this prior have? And there's all kinds of known proper properties and so on. For example, the mean is F0. Your prior guess is the mean of this distribution. So that's kind of intuitively satisfying. I'm sorry? No, no. A1 to AK is a partition that I've picked. Any partition. An arbitrary partition of the, so this is A1 is a set, A2 is a set, and I've just picked them arbitrarily. And th this has to hold for any choice of A1 to AK. In fact, and for any K as well. Okay. So it's just a characterization of what a Dirichlet process is. So in general, are there any Dirichlet distribution that allows you to draw the form of Dirichlet distribution? I'm not sure I understood. Are there any kind of Dirichlet distributions that no Dirichlet process can well, it's kind of the definition of it, though. So, yeah, it's, it's almost getting kind of circular. I mean, if it, if it wasn't generated this way, then we wouldn't call it a Dirichlet process. It's kind of weird, yeah. Was the question about the stick breaking process or the Dirichlet process? The Dirichlet process. Oh, okay. So it follows all the possible Dirichlet distributions. Well, this is the definition of a Dirichlet process. If it can't be, if it doesn't have this property, it's not a Dirichlet process. It's the amount of probability that F0 puts in A1. So it's so F0 of, of a set A, I really just meant uh, the integral over A just short form for that. <coughs> There's another characterization involving what's called the Chinese restaurant process, but I'm going to skip that. You can read that if you want. People like coming up with all these different characterizations. I want to get to the more important part, which is what do you do with it? How do you get the posterior? And we can't use Bayes' theorem, but again, the great thing about Ferguson's paper was he said, okay, it doesn't matter. If I have, here's what he showed. So, and just to make sure everything's concrete, I'm going to draw the parametric and non-parametric worlds in parallel. So in the parametric world, I imagine drawing theta from a prior, pi of theta. I imagine getting data from what? From f of x given theta. And then somehow we get down to a posterior distribution. So we're going to mimic that. I've described to you now that the, ran the parameter, remember, now is the CDF itself. And we've described how to draw from that. What's the model? The model is that the data come from the CDF, right? Where x1 to xn are assumed to be IID draws from this f. That's what we're trying to estimate. Just like that theta is what we're trying to estimate, the f is what we're trying to estimate. But now, what I really need to know is how to get the posterior distribution. How do I get the posterior for f? I shouldn't even, well, I'll write it like this, given x1 to xn. And we can't use Bayes' theorem. But luckily, we can still describe the posterior, and we can describe it in such a way that we know its properties, and we know how to sample from the posterior. Because, and perhaps this isn't too surprising, you might guess what the posterior is. The posterior is another Dirichlet process. It's a conjugate situation. So 
the distribution of f given x to 1 n is again a Dirichlet process, but the parameters have changed. The alpha has become alpha plus n, and the prior guess has been replaced with something I'll call f bar, and f bar is a convex combination of the empirical CDF that we defined earlier and your prior guess. <coughs> so we've sidestepped Bayes' theorem, but we still know that this has a posterior and it's a Dirichlet process. It's got a very simple form. You just add n to alpha and the prior guess gets replaced by this, which happens to be the posterior mean. This is the mean of the posterior over distribution space, and you can see it's just a, lin or it's a convex combination of your prior guess and the empirical distribution. And when n gets large, you can see that this is getting washed out, so it's getting pretty close to the empirical. So now what do you do with this? Well, we have an algorithm for drawing. So what we could do is, if you want to say, how do I look at the posterior? How do I look at a Dirichlet process? It's very abstract again. I just have this set of all distribution functions and now I have some sort of distribution over it. But the, the way we do it in practice is we draw. So we take a large sample, F1, F2, let's say up to Fn, capital N, from the posterior. And we can, we can draw these things and see what they look like, see where are they. We can even get a 95% band because I can now take all the draws and I can find numerically a band that traps 95% of the random draws. So I can find just numerically an L on a U so that when I simulate I see that 95% of the time the, the random draw from the posterior falls in there. We literally just draw, say, 100,000 times and then find two bands that have that property. And so what is the interpretation, though? It's quite different from the one we did at the beginning of class because this is a posterior statement. This says that the random draw from the posterior satisfies this. So remember in the frequentist statement, the CDF was a fixed unknown CDF. What was random was the lower and upper band. Those bands were random, and in our thought experiment you computed a different band every day, and you trapped the truth 95% of the time. This is different. This is saying if my prior beliefs were represented by this Dirichlet prior, then after seeing data, my posterior belief is that f is trapped in between this and this, and this is random in the Bayesian world, that's the parameter, with, with posterior belief 95%. That's the Bayesian version of this problem. If we did that thought experiment again with you and your roommate, where one of you did the first confidence interval that we did and the, the second person did this one, you're doing two different things. It's really important to keep that in mind. This one's not going to trap the true CDF 95% of the time. It's not designed to. There's no coverage <coughs> claim about this. This is supposed to be integrating your prior beliefs with the data. That's what this is for. So it's kind of simple on the one hand, but conceptually this is a little bit slippery. It can be, there's a lot going on here, including the fact that everything's sort of only implicitly defined. Let, let's look at page seven. There's an example here. The top left plot I just did an example with kind of an arbitrary alpha and F0, and I just drew from the prior. So what the top left plot shows is where the probability mass is going. That's the Ws. And then I formed the CDF, and you can see there's a, so that's just one typical draw from the prior in this particular example. Okay. And then I got, you know, I generated some data from a particular distribution. The bottom left plot shows just, I think, how many, draws did I do? Uh, several draws from the posterior, that's what this one is, including the posterior mean. 
And the bottom right plot shows a bunch of stuff. I hope you can see it. It shows the empirical distribution. It shows up better on your computer because that's in black. The true distribution and then the mean of the posterior as well as the 95% interval. And the point being that these can all be quite different from each other. Now when n is large, there won't be much difference. Because we saw when n is large, this prior part kind of disappears and we're back to the empirical CDF. But when n is small, or if alpha is large, which alpha represents your strength of your prior belief, then the Bayesian and the frequentist answer will be different. Okay. Good. So that's, that's everything we need to know in a nutshell about estimating a CDF. Estimating a CDF is probably not the most interesting problem in statistics, but it's always a good place to start because it's simple and we can talk about it in great generality. All right, any questions? I know this can be confusing, so, yeah. Just in case of a sanity check, uh, are all the properties of a CDF that, could, that we would most likely to have, uh, is it all of them are intact, like when you do a CDF estimation? Yes, <clears throat> so you're guaranteed that, that the, this is a true CDF, and, and in fact, uh, the prior and the posterior both are fully supported on the set of all CDFs. Not, they don't go outside this and get other functions or anything like that. It's guaranteed that you're putting probability one only on the set of CDFs. Yeah. Yeah, so Ferguson checked all these things very carefully because you're right. You want to make sure that you're, you know, th that what you get out doesn't, you know, become a, de is a decreasing function or something like that would be pretty weird. Right. Well, asymptotically, it's fine, yeah. So asymptotically unbiased. For finite samples, of course, it's biased because this is unbiased, but we're adding this to it, yeah. Is Dirichlet coherence the same as Dirichlet distribution? Well, the Dirichlet distribution is the finite dimensional version of the Dirichlet process. So when we're talking about the whole real line, it's a Dirichlet process. If we're talking about a vector of probabilistic and a multinomial, then it's a Dirichlet distribution. Yeah, so in parametric inference, there's been attempts to come up with non-informative priors. That's a bit controversial. And you might ask, is, the same, is there such a, such a thing here in the non-parametric case? It's pretty tricky. It's not clear what it means. But generally speaking, people would say, uh, yes, you just let alpha go to 0, because that's the strength of your prior belief. And so the non-informative case would be letting alpha go to zero is what most people say. The strength of your belief goes to zero. You're just back to the empirical CDF in that case. But doing it like a Jeffries prior, that kind of thing, that's all very, very leveraged on things like Fisher information, analytical properties, which just don't, don't exist on a space this big. Is the um, situation trying to draw any ways to draw? No. No, there's... There, I don't even know at this point how many ways there are to draw from the Dirichlet process. There are so many, there's been so many papers about tweaks to the Dirichlet process and ways to draw from it and so on. So I like the stick breaking one because it's simple and I find it just conceptually very clean. But I'm sure there are other ways that are more efficient actually than, than the stick breaking one. But I actually, I'm not up on that. So I, I don't know what the most efficient one is. The original one you couldn't really sample from, although you could always take a small, a partition it to small sets and use a, just an ordinary Dirichlet distribution. That would be an approximation. But you're right, there was no exact way at first to draw from it. Yeah. It was more of a conceptual idea. Uh, in what situations is this a better approach than just taking the empirical CDF? Well, that's, that's the lecture we skipped. <coughs> the question is, when is this better than the empirical CDF? It depends who you ask. Uh, I might be the wrong guy to ask because um, I don't think it, I would, if it's me, I would just use the empirical CDF and the, the, the uh, confidence set we did at the beginning. But there are people who prefer this approach and, you know, everybody has their own way of looking at things. So it really depends on how you look at it and your philosophy and so on. I mean, if you really did have strong prior information about what, you know, that you wanted to put in, 
this is a good way to do it. That's the nice thing about it. If you really had some prior reason to think F0 is a good guess, and you had a small amount of data, this might improve your estimate. What about other frequency currencies for the transmitter? Like is there, con I guess, is there consistency? Is there like yeah. a final sample? Like given that you need to make some additional assumption on the prior? So I'm going to get to, uh, well, if I have time, I have a whole section here on theoretical properties of non-parametric bays. The quick answer is, it's very easy in non-parametric gaze to get consistency. As long as you put positive prior probability in the neighborhood of the truth, it'll be consistent. It's much harder to get the posterior to concentrate at the optimal rate. It takes non-standard priors to do that. And it's almost impossible to get the posterior coverage to agree with the frequentist coverage. But consistency is pretty easy. If we have time, we'll get to that. OK, any other questions? All right, so let's get on to density estimation, which is a little bit harder, but more useful, probably. How are we going to estimate a density from a Bayesian point of view? Well, again, there's not one way to do it. There's, there's many different ways of doing it. In, in this class, what we used was a kernel density estimator from the frequentist point of view. So we're going to do something else from the Bayesian point of view. Actually, one way to do it, a, a kind of older way to do it, that was popular for a while, was the following. You just take a mixture of Gaussians. It doesn't have to be Gaussians, but let's say Gaussians. And let's say I'm on the real line. So what I do is I just take a mixture of Gaussians. But what are the parameters here? So there's the weights. There's the means. There's the variances. But there's one other parameter here. It's important to treat this non-parametrically, k. That's an integer, but you can still put a prior on it. So the nice thing about this is there's certain sampling methods, such as Gibbs sampling, that make it pretty easy to sample from the posterior. But it's, it's almost like a parametric model now. At least for fixed k, this is a parametric model. What makes it non-parametric is we might have a prior on k. k is an integer. We might put a prior that lets it go on and on and on and on forever, no, no upper bound even. And so you put, what you do is you put a prior on w, a prior on mu, a prior on sigma, a prior on k. You now have a fully specified Bayesian model because you've got a density with some parameters. You've got a prior on the parameters. Now you turn the Bayesian crank. You get the posterior. And this is a pretty easy one in the sense, well, it's easy and it's hard. It's easy in the sense that this is, this is one where something called Gibbs sampling works well. How many of you are familiar with Gibbs sampling? About half. Okay, Gibbs sampling is just a way of simulating from posterior. This is particularly well suited for it, although it's easy to program, but it's hard to get it to converge. <coughs> so there's, there's a, it's easy and it's hard at the same time. But conceptually, this is very simple. Now we have a, we're done. We have a posterior. We have a form for the density and so on. But this was in favor for a while, but people realized there might be a more elegant way to do this, which is this specifying a prior on k and having to decide about k seemed like a nasty problem. And so I think the first person who thought of this was Michael Escobar. He was a student of John Hartigan. John Hartigan is a very famous statistician at Yale. And this is what Mike did for his thesis work. This is, we're talking like maybe 1988 or something like that, which was the following idea. He said, let's write the density as an infinite mixture. I'll, I'll write it. I'm going to write this kind of generically. It doesn't have to be a normal, although usually the most common cases people use a normal, so this theta j really stands for two parameters, the mean and the variance. Now we got a lot of parameters here, right? And 
there's an infinite number of thetas and so on, but this is starting to look familiar because this is uh, starting to look a little bit like when we were constructing the Dirichlet process. In fact, what we end up doing here is we re-express this model in the following way, an infinite mixture, or a potentially infinite mixture, is we imagine this, I'm going to describe the prior now, which tells you again how, how, it's, how we generate a random density. We make use of the Dirichlet process. So this is called a Dirichlet process mixture prior. Not to be confused with a mixture of Dirichlet processes. We're not taking a mixture of Dirichlet processes. We're using a Dirichlet process to create a mixture. So and it, it works like this. We know how to draw a random CDF. So let's do that. from a Dirichlet process. So imagine we did that with our stick breaking thing. We have some discrete distribution. Now, here's the cool thing. F is discrete. This actually bothers people. A lot of people think the problem with the Dirichlet process is why are we drawing discrete distributions? Usually we want continuous things. But in this case, you're going to see it's actually a bonus. What we do now is we draw N thetas from this CDF. So we're not drawing the data from the CDF. We're drawing the parameters, one for each of the observations. We're allowing each xi to come from a different normal, theta i. And then xi given theta i comes from this model. So let's again think of the normal case. Now let's think about what we're doing. We draw a random CDF first. Here's a random CDF. Now I draw, let's just think of these as the means of the normal. So I draw n observations from this thing. And now I take the density for x to be a normal with that particular theta i. And I do a separate mean for each thing. So it's creating a mixture of normals, let's say. But I'm allowing there to be a different component for every observation. Okay? And that defines a random density. So I've just defined a prior on the space of densities. Now you might think, isn't that going to overfit? If I have a different normal density for each observation, it's going to overfit. But that's the beauty of this. Remember that this f, it's discrete. Right? What happens when you draw from a discrete distribution? You often get ties. In fact, the first few uh, of those stick breaking things are pretty big. So there's actually a few, if I draw the uh, mass function, there's usually a few large things. So what's going to end up happening is you're not going to get n distinct observations. You're actually going to get fewer than n. What you're doing is generating clusters. You're going to generate, let's say, these are, let's say your sample size is 100, maybe you'll draw 100 times, but you might only get like 15 distinct values. So that's like saying it's a mixture of 15 normals. It's automatically kind of forming clusters for you. It's, it's creating a mixture of normals with a kind of clustery structure to it automatically. And when, if I think about the density of the x's drawn this way, this is putting a prior again on the, on the density, on the space of densities. So it's just like the Dirichlet process thing, except we've added another layer to the model. It's like a hierarchical model, basically. And it's just a very clever way to define a, it's a clever way to define a, um, a random density function or a prior over the set of density functions. Okay, Is, any questions there? This one's a little bit more confusing because there's an extra step. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. So this theta, let's say in the normal case, is actually a pair, mu and sigma. So we actually need a bivariate <coughs> distribution in that case, which is what we do. Or typically a product, one for mu and one for sigma. OK. so. Now it turns out the posterior is somewhat complicated. I'm not going to go into the details, but it's again all about sampling. So people now spent a lot of effort saying, I can't write down in any way the posterior. Remember that the, 
what is the parameter space? The parameter space is some set of density functions. And you have to picture I've got some sort of prior distribution on a set of densities. Now you give me data. I have a prior, and I have a model for the data. That defines a posterior distribution on the space of densities. You cannot write it down, but there are very clever sampling schemes. They're a little bit more involved than the ones I just talked about. And I don't know, depending on how much simulation we do, we may or may not talk about them. But there's been many, many, many papers written about this because the original algorithms were very slow and people have since speeded them up. The important thing is that there is a posterior and we do know how to draw from it. There are various algorithms to draw from the posterior. So if you want to know what the density estimator is, the Bayesian density estimator, the way you answer that question is by, sa is by sampling. You draw P1, P2 up to, let's say, 10,000 draws from the posterior. This is now some sort of black box for generating density functions from the posterior. And the Bayes estimator, which would be the expected value of P given the data, is therefore approximately, we just average these draws from the posterior. And si similarly, you could get a 95% Bayesian uh, credible band and so on. And that's typically how it's done, is with simulation. Now there are a lot of parameters hanging around. Let me just warn you about that. Um, we have to specify this F0. What is that F0? That's your prior guess of the distribution. People often take that to be a normal. But then that normal itself has a mean and a variance, so people put a prior on top of that. And then alpha is a number, people don't like putting in a number, so they draw that usually from a gamma distribution, but the gamma itself has parameters. So I'm not trying to be facetious here, this is actually what's, in fact I, I wrote on page 10, I pulled one out of a paper, a typical paper that, just gen, uh, that lists some of the um, parameters. There's a lot of parameters to specify in this thing. So uh, again, I'm not necessarily recommending this, but that's a, this is, what, to, what you have to do. From my point of view, kernel density estimation, there's one thing, the bandwidth. <laughs> and we know how to pick it pretty well, cross-validation, right? So the Bayesian thing is, seems to me, maybe I'm wrong, but it strikes me as being much more complicated. It seems to me there's about eight or nine parameters you have to specify to do this. Um, and the theoretical properties of kernel density estimators are very simple. The theoretical properties of this, as if, if we have time we'll talk about, are much, much more intricate and still not uh, fully understood. But at a conceptual level, it is satisfying, though, that we know how to do this, right? We, still, we can do it in the sense that we, we do have a way to specify a prior on the space of densities, and we have a way to get the posterior on that space of densities. So we can do CDFs and we can do den densities as well. Okay, so we have uh, 20 minutes left. I should either do regression or talk about the theoretical properties. Let's see. Decisions. Decisions. Anybody have any preferences? Regression, okay. <clears throat> Let's see. How do you do regression? Let me emphasize again, though, that in each case I'm showing you one method, which I think is the most popular method in each case, but it's not the only method, okay? And so in regression, I'm going to show you Gaussian process regression. But again, it's not the only method. I think it's the most popular. So what's the non-parametric regression model? Let's say y of x is equal to m of x plus epsilon. Now, we do need a distributional assumption, it turns out. So I'm going to assume the epsilons are normal. And what's the parameter? The parameter, again, is a function m, the regression function. So the thing we need to put the prior on is, again, a function space. But now it's not the set of all CDFs and it's not the set of all densities. It's the set of all regression functions. And a common choice is this. So what is, let's, let's just draw a typical Regression function, well, it can be anything, right? Let's say in the real line. 
you know, unlike a density, it doesn't have to be positive, it doesn't have to integrate to one, so who knows, it could be any sort of arbitrary function. I need to somehow describe a prior. How do I describe a prior on the space of functions? And what we're going to use is what's called a Gaussian process prior. What's a Gaussian process? A Gaussian process just means any random function, you have some way of drawing a random function, with the property that if I look at the distribution of any finite number of coordinates, let's say here, 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 and here, and if I just look at those values, that vector has a normal distribution. Okay, so, so there exist many Gaussian processes, but what defines them again is that, think of it as a machine which generates a random function, but if I check the any finite number of coordinates, wherever, and I say what distribution do we get at those points, and it's multivariate normal. That's called a Gaussian process. A lot is known about Gaussian processes. So we're going to write this as, how are we going to write this? I don't think I gave it a name, so I'm going to give it a name. It's, I'm going to say it has a GP Gaussian process. Now it's got a mean. Okay, there's a mean function. That's your prior guess again. And there's also something called sigma, but this is not a matrix. It's an operator. What is this thing? Well, just like in a multivariate normal is a covariance matrix, this is called a covariance operator. But the way to think about it again is at any finite number of points, you fix any finite number of points, say xk, and I evaluate it at those points, I get just a usual normal distribution with mean mu of x1 down to mu of xk. And with covariance matrix, and this is just the sigma thing evaluated at xj, xi for the matrix that you get by evaluating it at all those pairs of points. If conceptually, just think of it as a normal on a very fine grid. That's really what the way to think about it. Well, the nice thing is, and of course this is why it's chosen, is if I assume epsilon is normal, then the likelihood, there is a likelihood in this case, and it's normal, and the prior is normal, I can multiply the prior by the likelihood, and not surprisingly, it's conjugate, and we get that the posterior is also a Gaussian process. There's a little calculation here, it's just the standard calculation. Actually, I didn't call, let me change to the notation I used in the notes. I called this k. And, and you're going to say that looks a lot like kernel, which is a good way to think about it. Because what ends up happening is the posterior, just by following, in this case, we can use Bayes' theorem. And actually, the data really consist of pairs here. So let me put the pairs of observation. It's also a Gaussian process, and in particular, the estimator, the mean of that process, is just a few lines here, you'll see, is simply, so m hat, which is the posterior mean of m given the data, is the kernel times the kernel. There's a sigma squared lurking around, which I didn't mention times y, and this should look familiar. This is just a linear smoother. It's another linear smoother. However, there's a slight complication. I haven't told you much about this function k, which specifies your prior beliefs on how related m of x and m of y are when they're close together. And so it's not just a matter of specifying on a bandwidth. There's a whole function you have to specify. And there are families of functions. There's things called the matern functions and various functions that have more parameters in them. So um, a fully specified prior, this actually is a family, let's say, containing other parameters, gamma. And there's, so if you read some papers, for example, by Zubin Garamani, he talks about there's like a vector of parameters, and he shows you pictures of what the typical draws m from the prior look like as you vary these parameters. So if you want to really smooth m, you have to set the parameters a certain way if you want to allow for a wiggly m and so on. This is how you control basically your prior beliefs about the smoothness of the function m. 
So it's very similar to linear smoothers that we've already talked about. Um, there are more parameters to specify. It, there isn't just a single parameter. But it does give you a well-defined posterior distribution. Uh, what would happen if you did it? Um, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, I think that's not going to work too good in this framework because I think you're going to get this very wiggly thing, but I have to think about it. Does it, you, Ryan? So why would I get zeros on the back part? <coughs> well, if you use the usual. Uh, oh, no, no. The, no, no. No, no, yeah. Right, you're not going to get zeros on it, right. But I'm still not sure whether the usual choice of kernel, like the Gaussian kernel, I, I guess how it's going to work here, too. Yeah. Uh, earlier in the lecture on uh, regression, we saw discussions of family the function in terms of the Hoyle stuff. Yeah. How does that relate to the Ah, so now we're getting to the theoretical questions. Let me just be, any other questions before I move on to theory? Yeah. Right, you're, uh, you guys are asking the same question, which is what you're intuiting here is, what are the properties of this thing? How flexible is it, for example, and so on. So this gets to the theoretical questions. We can now ask, we can step back and say, my friend Jim here is a Bayesian. I'm going to step back from the Bayesian and say, As, what are the frequentist properties of Jim's thing? Does, if, the, if the function is in a holder class, will I consistently estimate it? Uh, well, I have a f the minimax rate of convergence. If I compute a confidence set for the regression function, we'll contain it 95% of the time. So that's, that's what we'll briefly talk about now. Um, we don't have that, that much time left. I just want to give you a flavor for what the, what's known about this. There are different views on this, though. So there are people who philosophically feel that the Bayesian approach is, a, is some, in some sense just a better approach, and they'll dismiss the, fre say the frequentist properties are irrelevant. Who cares about them? So that's one point of view. Another point of view might say, no, it's good to step back and ask what the frequentist properties are. So that's the point of view we're going to take here. But I just wanted you to know that not everybody necessarily agrees with that. And there's really three questions we can ask, which is suppose that we're estimating a density or a regression function or whatever. What function class are we implicitly working with? And what is the behavior over that? And in particular, we want to ask three questions. Is it consistent? Does the posterior concentrate around the true function? OK, and the short answer is, this was resolved in the, <coughs> pardon me, it was resolved around, I would say, the, the late 80s, that the, the key is this. Most, it's very easy to construct Bayesian priors that do give you consistency over large classes of functions like holder spaces. And the trick is this. You have to just check that if I take a function and I put a little neighborhood around it. So let's talk about density estimation just to have a concrete example. So here's a density. Here's a true density. What you do is you look at the kullback weibler neighborhood. Instead of all Qs, remember the kullback weibler distance? I'll write it out for you. It's p log p over Q is less than or equal to epsilon. As long as every kullback weibler neighborhood around the true density has positive mass, and that has to be true over the whole function space, then you will get consistency. That's a little bit of a simplification, but that's the basic result. And do all these priors satisfy that? Yes, most of the priors people use satisfy that property. So consistency, people worried about it for many years. There was even some missteps by some famous statisticians going off in the wrong direction, saying things weren't consistent, but it turned out they didn't realize they weren't putting positive probability. You know, when you're first sorting things out, there's often a lot of confusion. But I'd say consistency is not so much of a worry anymore. Where things got more interesting was the late 90s, when people worked out the rates of convergence. Okay? And I'm not going to go through this in detail because it's very technical, but I just want to tell you what the kind of punchline is, which is the standard priors that people use, like those Gaussian process priors, 
you can ask at what rate do they concentrate around the truth? So we know it's consistent. Let's suppose we're doing regression. Here's the true m. And the posterior, it's consistent, so it's getting more and more concentrated. But at what rate? How small a ball can I put around here and say that the, the truth is concentrating in that ball? And it turns out that the standard priors do not converge at the minimax rate. They're slower than that. And I'd say that was a bit of a surprise. Now it turns out there's some fixes for that problem. And what you end up having to do is a mixture of priors. You take the prior and you do some tricks to the prior and you mix the prior together, a bunch of these priors together, and you can get the minimax rate. People seem not to worry about that though. I've never seen in practice anybody do these adjustments to get the minimax rate. And I think maybe people just think, well, okay, minimax is a nice theoretical property, but in practice, who cares? So and they want simple things. So, you know, fair enough. Okay. So, so people tend to not worry too much about whether it, you achieve the minimax rate or not. But the, but the answer is you can achieve it, but it's not with the straightforward, simple priors. You need more complicated priors. The third question is, oh, yes. Is it lower by a lot? Or is it like this lower? Um, I wrote, I actually forget. I wrote the rate down in the regression case. Um, it's a little, it's not that far off. It's not that far off. I'm talking about the prior and the mean. So I've just, I was, fo I focused, if you look at the notes, I focused on a pretty simple problem. It was only the mean that had to be specified. I, I, I didn't actually do the full case here. Okay, so the covariance prior doesn't make that much of a difference. Well, it probably does too. I just don't know how, how I'm actually ha not up on it. I'm not sure how well it's been investigated. Okay. Probably by now somebody has results about that. The third question is, about coverage. So if we go back to 705 and we go back to parametric inference, and if we imagined a, a Bayesian constructing their Bayesian region, the probability that theta is an A given the data now if I ask as a frequentist what's the coverage of this? What's, by coverage remember we mean treating a is random, what's the probability that, that the random set A traps theta? We saw examples where they disagree, but in nice regular problems, finite dimensional with satisfying all those regularity conditions, it would still be about the same for large n. At least asymptotically, a 95% Bayesian region is a 95% uh, frequentist region. At least asymptotically, that's true. It turns out in the uh, in the non-parametric case, that's not true. A lot is still unknown about it, but the, um, in fact, there was just a paper about this last year with some further results. The, the ones I'm familiar with are due to uh, Dennis Cox in 1993 and David Friedman in 1999, which had the alarming consequence that at least for a certain class of priors used in regression, the coverage was zero. The frequentist coverage was zero. So do we, if you compute the 95% Bayesian region, that's what's the frequentist coverage. In the cases they were looking at, they, they were surprisingly getting something which was going to zero as n goes to infinity. So that's pretty stark difference. And I don't know really if that's fixable or not. Maybe there's a way to fix that up. I'm not 100% sure I haven't. At that point, I have to say, at that point in the results, I said, okay, I'm not thinking about this stuff anymore. I just sort of gave up on it. So uh, maybe I'm a few years out of date. But as far as I know, uh, there's no easy fix for that problem. And again, you could have two different reactions. You could say, so who cares? I'm not trying to get coverage. I'm trying to just do a, a coherent Bayesian analysis, which is fine. Or you could say it's a problem and I should somehow fix it. But if you do want to fix it, I think it's still an open question in general how to do it. There was a paper by Ott van der Vaart last year that mentioned coverage and Bayes, and I haven't read it carefully, so I'm not sure what the state of the art is. So the way I would summarize this is, these tools are actually, uh, you know, they're pretty cool. I mean, I think the constructions are pretty interesting, especially things like the Dirichlet process and so on. But just keep in mind, you're computing posterior probabilities, 
They're not frequentist probabilities. They're different. Don't think of one as necessarily better than the other one, but they're just different. They don't mean the same thing. So if you're going to use them, you should use them with caution because you have to be aware that they don't necessarily have all the properties that we're used to. Okay, any questions? Yes, so it's a little bit hard to say what, the ba what are the Bayesian prop properties you'd want a Bayesian procedure to have. You'd want it to be your posterior distribution, and it is by definition. So I don't know what other property anybody would want. Um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of almost circular because by definition, see, in frequent inference, there's a sort of a notion of it's either right or wrong. Either your interval does contain the truth 95% of the time or it doesn't, right? But in Bayesian inference, you, you go through prior, likelihood, and posterior, and by definition, it's correct in the Bayesian sense. So there's no property for it to have. It's kind of a philosophical distinction. There are cases, though, where in some practical sense, these things just seem to work. A good one, I think, is document clustering, where people construct very elaborate priors involving Dirichlet, Dirichlet distributions. and you can't prove anything about it, but when you look at the clusters that come out, there's just no doubt in some intuitive, practical sense it seems to do something sensible. So that's pretty interesting. It's hard to pin down what that means, but that is, you know, there's something there, obviously. Any other questions? Are you a Bayesian or a Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we were skipping that lecture. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll give you my standard answer. People can't be Bayesians or frequentists. An analysis can be a Bayesian analysis or a frequentist analysis, but a person is a person. So you could, tomorrow you might do a frequentist analysis of one problem, and you might do a Bayesian analysis of a different problem. But I don't, it's not good to really pigeonhole yourself, I don't think. Even if the Bayesians are crazy. Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. That's, Ryan tells a joke every day, so I had to do a joke. <laughs> We're going to cut that last part out of the tape. Any last questions? actually very popular in some sense. The frequency yeah. material is a lot more classic, but if, if you guys were at NIPS this last year, you might notice that the something called Modern Non-Symmetrics Workshop had probably half the amount of people out of it the Bayesian Non-Symmetrics Workshop did. So it's very, very popular, especially in ML. Um, so just because yeah. we didn't spend time on it doesn't mean it's... That's right. If you had had different instructors for this course, you probably would have had six lectures on non-parametric base, right? So, so Keep in mind, I didn't maybe, I, I tried to be unbiased in my presentation, but I, I'm not sure if I was 100% successful. <laughs> All right, so we'll see you next week.